As of today, Vodafone decided that from Britain you cannot access the CCC websites anymore. And this is official. So we wonder, is this an achievement or is this a, a flaw? <laughs> Um, second announcement is that in your uh, conference papers you found a questionnaire on encryption. Um, it's created by the CIJ together with Van Holland Foundation and it's used to further develop policy for both organizations. So we would really appreciate it if you fill it in. The two boxes, one at the reception, one at the book stand. So uh, we can better sort of target next activities, so it would be really helpful if you take the trouble to fill in that questionnaire. You can do it tomorrow too, but please don't do it later than tomorrow. Yeah? <laughs> then now we go to your, in the, into our last session of today, which is about strategies for survival. We will have uh, two speakers, Annie Machon and Zander Wenema, shortly for each 10 minutes. Then we will have a joint presentation of Jake Appelbaum and David Amat Mazit from Subgraph. Uh, Jake will be uh, coming in through Skype and uh, David, you will be there. After that, we will have Julian Assange with us, also on the screen. But we start with Annie Machon, who is a uh, former MI5 agent who blew the whistle and since then has been giving lectures in many countries uh, campaigning against these kinds of secrecy and surveillance. She's the author of the book Spies, Lies and Whistleblowers, MI5 and the Secret Shaler Affair. Annie Machon. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be invited to, again to speak at a CIJ symposium, the Logan Symposium this year. Um, I was invited about three and a half years ago to talk about um, security and how journalists can protect their sources. And I've been speaking ever since at investigative journalist conferences across Europe on the same subject. And it felt, for a few of those years, a bit like an uphill battle. Journalists seemed very, very complacent, very comfortable with the fact they could protect even high-value sources. However, of course, since the wonderful work of a certain Mr. Edward Snowden, suddenly someone like me standing up and talking about the endemic surveillance state doesn't sound quite so paranoid, and people are beginning to take these subjects a little more seriously. So it's fantastic that the CIJ has pulled together a conference like this that meshes the journalistic world with the hacktivist world, with the whistleblower world. It's very important to see this blending of skills and knowledge. So well done, CIJ. Um, I have a certain nodding acquaintance with surveillance um, and also with the tech surveillance over the last few years. From the inside, when I was working as an MI5 intelligence officer, I was one of those people drafting the warrants to make sure that your, in, your telephones and your emails could be intercepted. I was the, the baddie on the inside intercepting your communications. And I know from the inside quite how easy it is, and this is way back in the 1990s, even then quite how easy it was for the spies to game that, to over-egg a case in order to get the surveillance they wanted. Now, of course, again thanks to Snowden, we see the sheer scale of how they are abusing that system with programmes such as PRISM and Tempera. Where did our Foreign Secretary in the UK get the authority to sign a warrant that covers the whole of the UK and then the whole of Europe, 500 million citizens having their communications intercepted? Um, However, what I, want to do to talk to, what I want to talk about today is not so much the, what you can do to protect the tech communications you as journalists might have with your whistleblowers and your sources, because it's great that journalists are taking these subjects seriously. But I think also there is a danger, potentially, that once you feel you have got your encryption up and running, once you feel you know you can use Tor, um, you know you can use the tail system, that you are safe and your source will be safe. And I think there can be a danger of a certain complacency with that attitude, because even with all that in place, there is still the real world around you. There is still the old school spy craft that can be used against you. And that's what I want to talk to you today a bit, a little bit about. It's the operational security, going back to the old <coughs> trade craft of the Cold War. And I know it's relevant, because even the modern incarnation of the KGB, the FSB, has now dictated that it go back to using typewriters for certain ultra-sensitive communications, 
So they are taking the threat from the NSA and its prostitute cohorts in Europe very, very seriously indeed. So how do you go about um, doing some real-world anti-surveillance? I just want to point out at this point as well, if there are any of our little security friends in the, off in the audience, I'm not saying anything from my time in MI5. Purely I'm talking about stuff that we can all read in good spy fiction. I promise. So there are various stages. Of course, you have to assess the risk. First of all, if a whistleblower comes to you, from which background are they approaching you? Because that will affect the risk assessment you make. If they're coming out of something like the health uh, sector or the business sector, then probably they will not be imprisoned for what they are doing, and probably there will not be huge corporate um, spy pushback. <coughs> However, we do know that major corporations and major world organisations will employ the corporate spy sector to try and identify and stop potential whistleblowers. And they do have a number of tools almost on a par with the state-level spies. So even if it's a whistleblower coming from the commercial sector, you need to be aware of some of these issues. However, if you get that fateful email or phone call from Citizen 4, for example, and you know that it's serious, and you know that you will be hounded and up against nation-state level threats, then that is when you have to really go back to the old Cold War spy mentality. First of all, you need to think about the legalities around it. What is the legislation in your country? What could happen potentially to your whistleblower if they're coming out of central government, or they're coming out of the military, or they're coming out of the intelligence agencies? In most countries, they will be automatically criminalized for exposing the crimes of others. Also though, what will happen to you as the journalist? Certainly in the UK, under the Official Secrets Act 1989, if you report the stories and disclosures from those levels of sources, you too could face prison. If they can prove you caused damage to national security by your writing or by your exposures, you could face two years in prison too. So you need to be aware, and this varies from country to country. So for example, in Russia, the whistleblower is always criminalized. But in Russia, the journalists are specifically not. They are specifically protected. So that really puts into sharp relief quite how draconian the secrecy laws are in the UK. The other laws you need to think about are the laws around what can be used as evidence, both against you and against your source. So, for example, in the UK, under RIPA, the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, the product of electronic intercept, your telephone calls, your emails, whatever, cannot be used in evidence against you in a court of law. Of course, it provides intelligence to those who are listening and reading because they can work out what you're trying to do, what your strategy is, what your stories are and your information. So you're giving away the game. But they cannot use it against you legally. However, if they put a property bug around your workstation or in your car or in your home and that picks up one end of a telephone conversation, that evidence can be used against you. So you need to be aware of that. In terms of the tradecraft, though, if you get that fateful phone call, you need to immediately swing into action. You need to have prepaid mobile phones, prepaid notebooks that you can go and meet your source quickly with and give to them so that you only communicate with each other using that, that tech. And you need to move fast because the one vulnerable point is when they first make contact. So the same day, go and meet them if you can because the spies will not have had time to swing into action, follow you and intercept you. You need to be aware also of setting up each meeting in advance ever after. So you meet in one hotel room and you tell them which hotel you will meet in next time so there's no electronic communication about it, no warning to the spies about where you will be. You need also to be aware of never ever talking or communicating with them when you're in your own workstation, when you're at home or in your car because they're very, very easy to bug and that can be used as evidence against you. And also, um, you need to be aware of mobile surveillance. So, for example, if, if MI5 or MI6 are trying to follow you, they will have not one or two men in grubby raincoats. They will have a team of 20 people or more following you around. And it's very difficult to try and get rid of them all. But dodging through big department stores with different exits, dodging through hotels with different exits can work. And some of the old tricks, like just standing in front of a, a, a big plate glass window so you can see who might be behind you, can help in this dry cleaning exercise, as the, uh, the novelists like to call it. So you have all that. 
However, in this era, post-Snowden, where we know that drones can hover up to two kilometers away and still read what is on your computer, where they can hear remotely from a mile away what you might be saying, the only really secure way of communicating with another human being, the ultra-paranoid secure way, is a pane of glass, one sheet of paper, you write on it under a cover, and then you get the person you want to communicate with to read what you've written under the cover, and then you shred it up, you burn it, you grind it up, and you flush it down the loo. That is the only secure way we now can guarantee that we can communicate privately with each other. We have to be that paranoid. But I do think, just to finish, as a whistleblower from that perspective, and from the journalistic perspective as well, if you take all these points seriously, and you show that you are willing to invest time and expertise to protect your source, and you know what you're talking about, you will gain a reputation as the go-to journalist, someone that other future potential whistleblowers can trust to look after them during the process and ideally help them after the process when too many whistleblowers can be left high and dry. And that way, from a journalistic perspective, is surely a win-win situation because your reputation will speak for itself and other whistleblowers will flock to you as well. So I hope that's just a, a quick run-through of some of the simple steps we can take. I could talk for hours about this, but I will cede the floor. Thank you very much.